Are you ready to learn? Because my super experienced guests are ready to share some really valuable information. Make sure and listen all the way to the end to get help and support. So let's start with the best audio experience. Hello, guys. Welcome. Welcome to our show. Good people. Welcome. By the way, I don't want to discriminate bad people. Welcome to our show as well. Anyone who want to learn more about human psychology, welcome. Because today you can learn why people buy products, why they change their heart and money with uh, your products. And I'm so excited to discuss this topic with Nancy Harkat. How are you? I am well, Anatoly, and I'm happy to be here, and I'm excited to talk about it with you, too. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, for me, it's a big pleasure, especially because I got this gift, uh, awesome gift. You know, I love it. So I keep reading. Um, I, I need to finish, uh, but I keep reading, and I got a lot of valuable insights. And, you know, I had the problem a few years ago. Uh, I overwatched TV then. I replaced this bad habit by reading books. So today I spend so much time by reading books. Thank you. Thank you a lot for your book because you know how to share value. You know how to lead in the right direction. Nancy, before we start, just tell more about yourself, about your background and give our audience a solid reason to read your book that you gave to me. Sure, sure. So, uh, so my name is Nancy Harhut, and I am the Chief Creative Officer of HBT Marketing. And HBT stands for Human Behavior Triggers. And what we do is we combine direct marketing and digital marketing best practices with behavioral science in order to increase the likelihood that people will do what our clients want them to do. And when I say behavioral science, what I'm talking about is the study of uh, how people behave, why they do what they do, how they make decisions. And what behavioral scientists have found is very often people don't make decisions so much as default to them. Uh, they've developed, we as people have developed over the millennia, certain automatic, instinctive, reflexive behaviors. And what happens is we cruise along through life on autopilot. When we encounter a certain situation, we just default to these hardwired behaviors, giving them little, if any, thought. And so for marketers, that's really important because if we're aware of the fact that people are going to default to these hardwired behaviors, we can place triggers or nudges or prompts in our strategies and in our creative in order to make it more likely that people do what we want them to do. And uh, so that's what HBT Marketing does. And that's what my book, uh, Using Behavioral Science and Marketing, talks about. It's It's... 288 pages, 17 chapters, just filled with practical, tactical, uh, actionable ways that we can use what science has learned about human behavior in order to influence it. And that's a very, um, you know, valuable thing for a marketer to be able to do. Yeah, nice, nice. Valuable. Okay, Nancy, I have the first question. You know, uh, I read many books and uh, I found that many books are good for sleeping. You know, when you have problems with sleep so you can do you can take some new boring book uh, read it and sleep well all night you don't need to pay for pills for anything but your book is different you know you share a lot of examples stories i love them and uh, i didn't get this feeling of course i love consuming can you tell about your writing secret you know uh, the reason why i'm asking about that because uh, all online content depends on creating non-boring content, even in boring niche. Uh, for example, once I spoke with Jim Edwards, he worked uh, 10 years in Business Insider. Then um, uh, the company was sold like for $500 million, 1,000 employees, a big company, well-known brand. And he told the secret depends on creating non-boring content. Uh, and can you tell your methods how to write such content that people want to consume that uh, because you know today bounce rate is high you know uh, any content video content audio podcasts uh, blog articles people bounce fast and never get back so tell how to uh, get their attention how to catch them and give a solid reason to consume until then Sure. So you make a very good point. If you don't grab somebody's attention and you don't hold their attention, uh, they'll they'll fall asleep or they'll walk away. Uh, you know, we're going to lose them. And you know, very often in marketing, we're so excited about 
our product, our service, our company, that we, we, we want to tell everyone about it because it comes from a, a good place. We really believe that our product or our service is wonderful and we want to tell people all about it, tell them everything about it. But the problem is they may not be as interested as we are. They're much more interested in what the product can do for them. And so the, the key, I believe, to making sure that we attract attention and that we hold attention is to write with our readers in mind. So it's not so much about what we want to say, but it's about what our reader wants to hear or what they want to read. So it's focusing much more on them and, uh, and their needs, their goals, their hopes, their dreams, their problems, their challenges that, that they're trying to solve. But it's really looking at things through the reader's eye. And uh, when, I, when I write for clients, I always say to clients, we're going to downplay our use of words like I, we, our company, our product, our service, and we're going to increase our use of the word you, because that's an I, uh, that's a, that's a word that the I goes to. The human eye will gravitate to the word you. We're skimming and scanning as we read. When we see our names, our I goes right to it. And when we see the word you, our I goes right to it, because you is a, is a substitute for our own name. So I really say that what we need to do in order to keep people's attention is to focus on the reader, you know, use that word you, think about what it is that people want to find out about that, you know, they're trying to find an answer to and focus on delivering that answer. It's not all about what we want to say. It's about what people want to hear. And I think that's a, that's a good secret to doing good writing, writing that keeps people yeah. <laughs> interested and engaged. Mm -hmm. I love secrets, <laughs> love secrets because, you know, I found that uh, for me, best practices don't exist. Because, you know, best practices are good for someone. So you can find your best practices. <laughs> uh, okay, Nancy, I have the question about, um, uh, you mentioned that you need to write for readers. But how to learn their uh, pain points, interests, and any other stuff uh, to understand what kind of information do I need to create for readers? Because, you know, I found many companies use the average data. You know, they use online tools, uh, IHREF, SEMrush, many others. What they do is just to learn average data. But customers are different. You know, even if two companies can sell the same products, they have their unique selling proposition, different customers. And once uh, I decided to set up, uh, you know, the same marketing message on YouTube channel, uh, but I took data from my website. I found that uh, people are different on YouTube. They have different mindset. They want to learn more about digital marketing on my website. They order services uh, or any other uh, things, but they're different or different mindset. So can you tell how to learn customers, how to understand their pain points uh, before creating content? Yeah, that is a, that's a good question because um, you're right. You can have two people buying the same product, but they might be buying it for different reasons. Or you might have uh, one person who consumes content in one channel one way, and that same person might consume content in a different channel in a, in a different way. Uh, it might depend on, on the context. It might depend on the environment. It might depend on you know, what, their, um, what their particular need is, what they're doing. So uh, what I usually do with my clients when we're, uh, we're creating pieces, whether they're emails or, or direct mail pieces or digital ads or, or blog posts, social posts, uh, what we do is we'll work together and what we'll try to identify is the main reason that someone won't want to do what it is we're asking them to do. So for example, if we're writing an email trying to sell a particular product, we want the person to buy the product, what's the number one reason they won't want to do that you know so a lot of times people focus on here's all the reasons why you should want to do this and there's nothing wrong with that we want to have the benefits and you know the advantages but uh but what we also need to think about is what's that thing that's going to be standing in the way that's going to be holding someone back from taking the action we want them to take and once we can zero in on that that can really inform what we're writing for that particular assignment or that particular project, a product project, whether it's an email or mm -hmm. a blog post or, you know, so, um, you know, if I want you to buy my new product, uh, but it turns out that one reason you may not is because you've never heard of my company. Maybe it's a new company or maybe it's a company that's been established, but it's expanding into new areas. And so somebody might say, well, I, you know, it sounds like a good product, but I, I've never heard of them before. So then we might want to say, well, all right, we need to overcome that barrier. So how can we overcome that barrier? Well, we can we can tell people that a lot of people 
just like them have already made this purchase decision. Or we can tell people that um, there are certain authorities in the industry that endorse our product or that recommend our product. And these are the kinds of things that help overcome that buying barrier. Maybe I've never heard of the company, but if I see that a lot of people like me have already purchased the product and they're happy with it, well, then I feel like it's probably a safe bet. Or if I see that somebody uh, in the industry that I really recognize, an expert or uh, an association, you know, the American Dental Association or something has endorsed it, I would then think, okay, it's, it's probably a, a safe bet. So I think, you know, when we're trying to write for people and we're trying to get them to do what we want them to do, we need to think about, you know, the particular mindset that they're in at the time that they're going to be encountering the communication. And then we need to, you know, to write to that. And so how do we, you know, how do we think about, well, what's that mindset going to be? And what's that barrier going to be? You know, there are a number of different ways we can do research, we can do customer interviews, we can read reviews, we can read posts, do social listening. Uh, and sometimes it's, it's just a little bit of good old fashioned marketing, uh, elbow grease, if you will, where we, you know, we sit down in, in a room with our client, and we say, all right, you know, let's let's imagine that uh, this is the you know the situation where our prospect is. What's likely going through their head? Uh, you know, it could be this, it could be this, it could be this. Let's test a few things and let's see what the market tells us in terms of response. So it's kind of a long-winded answer, but uh, that that's uh, kind yeah. of the way we go about it. Yeah, thank you. Valuable. Okay, uh, you know, uh, I love learning from big brands. For example, Apple. Once I watched the presentation with Tim Cook when he shared three stories how Apple Watch can decide uh, my problems. Now, after watching this presentation, I got the feeling I need to have this Apple Watch. Uh, and I bought three pairs for me, for my son, for my wife. You know, they probably kill me if I buy only for myself, but it doesn't matter. I, I got three pairs because of the feeling that I can have this Apple Watch. I can own them. Today, the Atlantic Ocean owns my Apple Watch. It happens, but, you know, uh, you know, uh, I found that many companies submit a lot of features. Uh, Apple Watch has many great features, but uh, on their marketing, uh, I got the feeling about uh, touching my emotions, you know, uh, uh, stories, how Apple Watch can decide my problems. So can you tell how to create this feeling? You no, know, uh, it's not about features. Uh, okay, we need to, uh, uh, I don't know, like uh, we need to use logic. We need to give a reason. But 75% of all decisions are emotions. So any insights, how to create the feeling that uh, customers need your products. <laughs> Yes, that's a very good point. A lot of times in marketing, we think it's all about the, the list of the features or even the benefits as well as the features. And, and those are good and they play a role. But we know from behavioral science that people make buying decisions for emotional reasons. And this is true in business to consumer marketing. And it's also true in business to business marketing. And sometimes in business to business marketing, people say, oh, no, not, you know, not for us, maybe for the people selling donuts and, and beer, but, uh, but not for the people who are selling uh, software solutions or, you know, but it's true, you know, people are people, whether they're at home or at the office and uh, people make decisions for emotional reasons. And then they later justify those decisions with rational reasons. So what it means to us marketers is we want both emotional and rational components to our marketing. And some of the most powerful emotions that, that we can stoke uh, include things like loss aversion, which is a little counterintuitive because a lot of times we think it's all about, you know, the good things that are going to happen, the wonderful things that will happen if you buy our product or sign up for our service, how great you're going to feel. But, but it turns out that behavioral scientists have found that people are twice as motivated to avoid the pain of loss as they are to achieve the pleasure of gain. So sometimes uh, when, we're, when we're trying to stoke emotions, what we want to do is get people to think about the pain they may be in if they don't purchase the product or sign up for the service. Or maybe we even just talk about the pain they can avoid if they do purchase the product or they do sign up for the service. You know, another good emotion is, um, you know, the idea of, of feeling confident and and comfortable and, and reassured people like to feel that and so that's when things like social proof come into play it's like a lot of other people do it i feel that it's a, a safe bet uh, uh, another emotion that's out there is this idea of, of wanting to feel 
exclusive or that you're in on something that not everyone else can get. And that's where the idea of scarcity can play a role because we value things that are harder to get. So if something is readily available, you know, we may or may not want it. If we want it, we take advantage of it. If we don't, we don't, no big deal. But when you tell people, oh, not everyone can have this, or there's only a certain number available, or it's only available for a short amount of time, suddenly people feel like, oh my gosh, I have to have that. I want to be the one who has it. You know, it's like, get get out of my way. (laughs) You know, I'm going to get that (laughs) Uh, because we like to feel that we have something other people don't. It's funny, earlier, Anatoly, you used the word secret. You said, oh, I love to find out secrets. Secrets. And hmm. secret is actually a very powerful word. If you use the word secret in a subject line, you can get a double digit yeah. lift in your opening rate. But people hmm. like secrets because secrets represent scarce information. If, you know, if everybody knows it, well, it's not all that valuable, but if only a few people know it, if you could say you're the, you know, the first person to try something or the first person to know something, you have early access to something that, you know, those are all things that make you feel really good. They make you feel kind of special. They make you feel like, you know, you're, uh, you know, a, a little bit better than your, your friends or your, you know, your neighbors. And those are powerful feelings. And those are, those are the kinds of feelings and emotions that motivate people to, to act, to make a purchase or to offer up information or to take that next step so uh so those are some of the some of the feelings that are some of the emotions that uh that i use on a regular basis in the marketing that i create uh because i know that they're very effective mm-hmm. yeah nice you you remind me my son you know he always uh, highlights about new sneakers uh he told me you know it's limited collection we need to buy because we can lose the opportunity to buy this nike and uh for me you know i can see just uh sneakers nothing special yeah good sneakers but you know i usually pay like uh, 50 dollars for sneakers but uh, this costs uh 150 dollars three times more and for me yeah it, it's hard to explain to him that it doesn't matter it's limited or not we have many other choices no way it's a limited collection i need to have it because on school my other students will not respect me, you know, because I I use the same generic uh, items that others have. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. I always have these discussions at home. And uh, I want to ask you about reciprocity. You uh, you share a lot about reciprocity. Uh, I got this um, education from Roberto Caldini from his awesome book, and you uh, mentioned about him as well. So. Uh, and today I know that givers get more than takers, you know, when you share value, when you help others, when you find the way how to help your customers. So uh, uh, customers uh, want to give something back to buy your products or recommend many things. So can you tell how to uh, create, to use this reciprocity rule, how to uh, help customers before selling something? Yeah, yeah. So reciprocity is is actually very powerful, as you say. When when somebody gets something from someone else, if if uh, if they're given a gift or if someone does a favor for them, what they want to do is they want to somehow return that favor, return that gift. They they want to pay back what the other person has done for them. You know, we feel this need that we want to even the score. We don't we don't like to owe somebody. We don't like to be in the debt of someone. So if someone does something for us, whether or not we ask for it. If somebody does something for us or somebody gives us something, we feel that we we want to return the favor. There, uh, Robert Cialdini, as you say, wrote about it in, in his book, uh, Influence the Science of, of Persuasion. Um, there was there was actually a professor from Brigham Young University named Philip Kuntz, and he was running an experiment, and he proved how powerful reciprocity can be. What he did is he chose strangers from, uh, from a, a phone directory, just randomly chose strangers, and he sent them a Christmas card. And then... Yeah. Walked, you know, he watched to see what would happen, and over 20% of the people sent him a card back. He actually stopped the experiment, or that number would have might have climbed even higher, but he ended up stopping it. But, but you know, you imagine you're you know at home and you get this Christmas card, and you're like, uh, "Honey, do you know the Kuntz family?" And you know, your spouse says, "No, I don't. I don't. I don't know them either." But well, they sent us a card. We should send someone back. And so, what do you do? You pull out a card and you send it back you put it now because they sent one to me so I want to send one back to them you know we like to return you know what someone has done for us and uh, Kuntz reported that people continued to send him cards for years these total strangers continued to send him cards for years <laughs> so um, and I totally I have a, an interesting story for one of my clients where we used the reciprocity principle uh, it was a client that sold um, 
financial funds, like, you know, mutual funds and retirement mm -hmm. funds, things like that. And they sold them through a financial advisor, through a series of financial advisors. And a certain group of financial advisors had stopped selling the funds over a year ago, 12 months or more, you know, ago, and they really wanted to reactivate them. And so they had been trying to call them, trying to email them, you know, trying to can kind of make contact and get them back into the fold and they weren't having any luck and they they came to us and said you know can you help us and we decided to use the reciprocity principle we decided to send them a gift and your listeners that say i don't know nancy that doesn't make sense why would you send a gift to people who aren't doing what you want them to do if, if you're going to send a gift send a gift to the financial advisors who do sell your product you know reinforce yeah. the behavior thank them for that that would seem to make sense the idea of sending a gift to someone who had stopped doing business well it sounded kind of counterintuitive but nevertheless that's what we did first we sent an email that said uh there's a gift that we picked out especially for you it will be arriving in the mail you know in, in a day or two please watch your mailbox and a couple of days later this a white box shows up and inside the box is a New Yorker cartoon and it's it, it's framed it looks really beautiful the um, you know the cartoon was amusing if you happen to be in financial services it made sense it was relevant and the caption was personalized so yours would have your name in it mine had my name in it you know so you get this beautiful New Yorker cartoon with your name in the caption obviously you're gonna hang on to it you're gonna hang it on your wall or put it on your desk and there was also a note from the wholesaler from our client who said hey we've been trying to get in touch with you we would love to have a conversation see how you're doing tell you what we're up to you know please give us a call uh, you know if, if we don't hear from you we'll be giving you a call you know in a few days and what they found is they reactivated 350 percent of this group of people who you know had stopped or that I'm sorry they didn't react they reactivated enough so that sales went up 350 percent and they um they, they found that they got a 68 million dollar return on investment for the promotion which is you know incredible yes. they ended up talking to sales reps that had left the fold they came back in and they they started to do business with them and you know you can kind of see why if the wholesaler called you know you couldn't say to your secretary or your administrative assistant hmm. you know oh tell them i'm not there because you're, you're hmm. looking at that frame cartoon on the wall and uh you know and then you know you got it and you think gosh i didn't ask for it but they did send it to me and i you know i do like it it was kind of nice and maybe i should sell some of their funds but 68 million in incremental revenue uh from uh, you know from that promotion so it really does prove uh that the power of the reciprocity principle the, the power of this idea of give to get be the first person to give it puts you in a great place to, to get something back in return it puts the recipient in the mindset of giving something back to you so it can be very very powerful yeah, nice, nice. Yeah, valuable. Okay, let's talk about social proof. You uh, wrote a chapter about social proof. And once I got a client who told me he tried to pay uh, actors, bad actors, you know, to uh, film video review about his products and uh, results were low. Then he decided to tell customers, please uh, film video review. Uh, they were not actors but results were much higher because it's true, it's honest, you know, it's authentic. Can you tell more about social proof? How to use the right way uh, social proof? Uh, where to submit this information? Any insights about social proof? Yeah, yeah, you know, social proof is interesting. What it really does is it makes people feel confident about what they're going to do. Uh, you know, if you're, we're not sure what to do, what we, you know, what we end up doing is we look around we see what other people are doing and we follow their lead. You know, if, if we're asked to make a decision or we're presented with a, a situation where we have to decide something, we don't know what we want or we don't know what to do. We don't have any experience. What we do is we look around, we see what other people are doing, particularly people who are like us, and we follow their lead. And, and what's interesting, Anatoly, is we don't think that those people are just as lost as we are. We think they know something that we don't. So if a bunch of people are doing something, we think they must have the answer they must know what they're doing and and i'm the one who's you know out of the out of the loop i'm the one who doesn't know so when other people are doing something we feel they know therefore i should do that same thing because it's probably a safe bet it, it removes you know the the feeling of risk or of fear that we have when we're going to be entering new territory trying a new product or a new service or a new vendor it's like if, if enough other people are doing it we feel it it must be safe and so there are a number of different ways that marketers can 
can trigger social proof or signal social proof. We can talk about the number of customers we've served. We can talk about our most popular options. We can talk about our fastest growing categories. And one of the other things that we can do is we can run testimonials, you know, the, the uh, testimonials from customers who have used us because uh, while people may doubt what a marketer says, you know, the, well, of course the marketer says it's good, it's their product. Why wouldn't they say it was good? Uh, but yeah. if, if it's an actual customer, someone who's more like me, you know, I have a tendency to believe them more. And the, the secret, if you will, about testimonials is they don't all have to be absolutely perfect. In fact, if you can find a testimonial that starts at a place of skepticism, and then end up in a, you know, in a place of, I bought the product and I was happy with it. Those are the best. So you can have a testimonial that says, you know, I love Acme wig widgets. There's nothing like them. And as a marketer, you might think, oh, that's a, that's a great testimonial, but you're really better off with a testimonial that says, you know, I used to think all widgets were the same, but then I tried Acme widgets and they are wonderful. They're better than anything else. You know, if you can find one that, you know, says, I wasn't sure it was going to be worth the money. I thought maybe they charged a little bit, you know, their price was a little high. So I wasn't sure if they were going to be any good or, you know, I, I had to drive a little further out of my way to find this, but boy, am I ever glad that I did. You know, if you can start where the, the reader is or the listener is, you know, they're going to recognize their, their, themselves. They're going to say, yes, I was thinking that Acme was a little too expensive too, or I was thinking that Acme was not as convenient as some of the other, you know, providers. But, you know, this person thought the same thing, but they spent the extra money or they drove the, you know, the extra miles and they were really pleased. So now I feel that I'm going to make that same decision. It's going to be a safe decision and it's going to end up in a, in a good place. So social proof is a very common decision making shortcut that people rely on and you know anytime a marketer can use it it puts that marketer in a much better place because people are skeptical of what marketers say they're much more likely to believe what other people people like them say and what you know what they talk about what their experiences are mm -hmm. yeah awesome awesome uh nancy uh when i uh, read your book uh, you remind me about one client uh he uh, no he told me if you can provide results for a month, I'll share a good contract, big contract. Uh, it's hard. It's really hard to provide results for a month. But uh, when I opened his website, luckily, he had traffic like 100K a month, good traffic, you know, uh, in the weight loss supplements uh, uh, niche. And uh, we spent some time uh, by learning uh, on his website and found that all uh, titles were written for the sake of having them. No, nothing special, generic text. Uh, then uh, uh, when I read the book with uh, David Ogilvy, and he told, if you want to inv invest a dollar to content, 80 cents need to invest to your title. Because uh, people read titles before opening content. They don't know what kind of value they can get before opening. So even if you have the best content, in the world but uh, people might skip and uh, don't open if your title is generic boring so we rewrote titles on this website and uh, got results uh, two times more traffic uh, uh, a month uh, for some pages uh, three four times more because of just rewriting these titles uh, and uh, uh, after reading your book uh, you remind me about that that it's important to use some special words on title can you tell how to write titles that give a solid reason to open content to consume content uh any any insights about that <laughs> Yes, yes, and you're, you're absolutely right, uh, you know, content titles or headlines for ads or subject lines for emails, they're, you know, they're all the gateway to somebody going deeper into the content and consuming it, and if they don't like the title or the headline doesn't capture their attention or the, the subject line doesn't motivate them, they'll never get to the, the you know, the heart of the information, and so we do have to be very careful as we're constructing them that we write them in a way that uh, really pulls people in. And so, you know, one way, of course, is to be more you focused. It's not about us, our product, our service, our company. It's about, you know, you, the prospective customer. So simply using the, you know, the word you is very, very powerful. But there are other very powerful words that we can use. Um, 
One of them is the word easy because the human brain is hardwired to uh, opt for the, the easy, right? We like things that are easy. We like things that are simple. So anytime we can use the word easy or quick, uh, our eye goes right to it. There was yeah. a study that actually showed that the words easy, quick, and improved all separately, individually lifted product sales in market. So easy, quick, and improved are good. Anything having to do with uh, news or novelty can be really good because the human brain is hardwired to seek out the new and novel because when we find something that we think is new, it activates the reward center in our brain that releases dopamine and, and that feels good. And so as a result, we're kind of constantly looking for that next, you know, jolt of dopamine, that next feel good feeling. So if we see something that we think is new, we get it. So anytime we come across the word new, now, introducing, announcing, yeah. finally, soon, discover. Discover is way better than learn. I always say learn makes it sound like you're stuck in school and you'd really rather, you know, you'd rather be outside at recess, you know, but you're stuck sure. inside. Uh, but discover is all about, you know, finding something new. So, you know, words that, that uh, revolve around the idea of news can be very, very powerful. The word because is really interesting. Uh, behavioral scientists have found that the word because is a automatic compliance trigger. When we see or hear it, we start to nod yes, we start to agree before we've even processed what comes next. You know, we, we just see it and we assume whatever's coming next is a good legitimate reason. So if we could serve up something using the word because, you know, uh, because uh, because you'll you'll really like this, because you really need one of these, uh, you know, because you'll regret it if you don't get one. But having that word because is, is very important. And then um, also uh, who, where, when, why, and how can be very powerful because what they do is they trigger something called information gap theory, which is a term coined by a, uh, a neuroeconomist named George Lowenstein. And uh, what he found was if, if there's a gap between what you know and what you want to know, you'll take action to close the gap, you know, and, and as marketers, of course, we want people to take action. We want them to, you know, read that, uh, you know, that title and then go on and read further, you know, or open that email or you know, we want people to take or buy the product. Ultimately, we want people to take action. <laughs> if we can serve up the content with who, what, where, when, why, how, uh, that, you know, that pulls people in. Using numbers, specific numbers can also be important. Instead of saying, here are some reasons, we say, here are three reasons or here are five reasons. And that specificity uh, kind of suggests credibility and pulls people in. So uh, so those are, those are a number of different ways that we can construct our titles so that they're more likely to be read and they're, they're more likely to capture somebody's attention and get them to go further. Nice, nice. By the way, you know, you unhided secrets how my uh, online calculator works because we created headline calculator that can analyze you know, uh, your uh, the score of your titles and descriptions. By the way, right now my team is working uh, to update this tool with uh, AI. So we are going to write even these titles with AI technology. Uh, yeah, uh, it's coming soon. Uh, and yeah, we use uh, numbers, uh, powerful words. Uh, we got all uh, this information from studies from Moss, uh, HubSpot, uh, even from David Ogilvy. We took all this combination and created our calculator. <laughs> so yeah, and when I read your book, I got it. I need to add some extra words to my calculator to my <laughs> base uh, by the way guys if you need these words you can find on this book in my end. and uh, yeah and use this tool it's completely free okay Nancy, i have the question about common mistakes can you list common mistakes that companies still do and how to find a much better way yeah so um so I think you know one mistake is they they talk too much about themselves and, and we've discussed this a little bit earlier but you know yeah. just focusing too much on you know their product their service you know and not enough on the on the company I'm sorry on the customer um, another mistake I think that uh, that we often make is we try to put too much information out there and so what that results in is uh, you know just a wall of text these big thick paragraphs uh, you know just no no white space no just no place to look and you know when people see that they just go oh, that looks like a lot of work I, I don't you know I don't want to do it similar to that uh, sometimes marketers use uh, unusual typefaces because they think oh it's you know it's fancy or it's different or it'll make me stand out but if the unusual typeface is difficult to read mm -hmm. uh, what you can do is, is you can turn readers off if something is hard to read people will believe that it's hard to do and they'll either 
even they'll either stop reading it or even if they finish reading it, they'll come away with, with the idea that what they've just read about is going to be difficult to do. And, and that's not something that they, you know, they're going to want to do. Another mistake that we do is we rely too much on acronyms and buzzwords and um, kind of industry terms, industry vernacular that not everyone is familiar with. And as a result, you know, people will be reading and they'll come to a point and they're not entirely sure they know what the word means. And, you know, that, you know, makes them feel, um, well, you know, make, make, makes them feel not as intelligent or makes yeah. them feel like, oh, I've got to stop and look this up. And what happens is eventually they'll abandon what they're reading and, and they'll find another source that's easier to understand. And this is true, you know, again, not just in, you know, uh, business to consumer, but it's also true in business to business. There have been studies that show that, um, you know, when, when companies feel that they need to use these large words and these, you know, long sentences and these run on, you know, sentences that, uh, you know, that people not only have a harder time reading and understanding the information, but they, um, you know, the, the, the harder words to understand actually make them think that the, the authors aren't as intelligent. So there was a study that was done with, um, it was abstracts of, uh, thesis papers in college and what the researchers did is they found every word that was uh, nine letters or longer and they replaced it with a shorter synonym and then they tested and they had people read the original paper with the nine letter words and they had other people read the paper with the shorter synonyms not only did people prefer the papers that had the shorter synonyms they rated the authors as more intelligent so uh so i think you know another one of the mistakes that we make is we you know we feel like we have to use these big words you know these complicated phrases because it's a business to business audience or it's an expensive product or it's a technical product and even in those environments, people prefer simple, easy to understand information. Behavioral scientists talk about something called cognitive fluency, which in and of itself is a bit of a mouthful, but cognitive fluency means that people yeah. prefer things that are easier to think about and easier to understand. Not only do they prefer them, uh, they judge them to be more truthful, more accurate, and they feel more confident in their ability to make a decision about them. So I, I think, you know, making sure that our marketing messages are cognitively fluent, making sure that they're written in easy to understand language, that they're easy to absorb is really important. And that is a mistake that a lot of um, marketers make. They, you know, they don't always write with the idea of cognitive fluency in mind. And as a result, it costs them not only readership, but it costs them business. It, 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 there's an economic cost to it as well. Nice, nice. Yeah, love it. Love it, Nancy. Uh, uh, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, it's awesome, awesome. Uh, and uh, uh, I have the question about AI. Uh, you know, I get a lot of questions. It's a hot topic right now because of chat GPT. You know, uh, many students uh, in my network are asking uh, what kind of future will be <laughs> because AI can replace us. And once I read each interesting book about uh, puzzles, you know, and the author uh, shared a story with Gary Kasparov. Uh, and he asked Gary Kasparov about the future. Uh, what he his thoughts about the future because ai can replace many of us and he told he uh, doesn't worry a lot about the future uh, and it's interesting because he was the first human being that was beaten by machine you know machine beat him uh, in 1997 you know he was uh, the world uh, champion you know in chess and uh, AI could beat him, you know, uh, the first time. So, but he told uh, uh, many occupations disappear time to time. That's okay. It's part of the evolution. You can find uh, other occupations. You can adapt to new technologies. Can you tell about the future? What kind of future will be in your prediction? Because many things are changing so fast. Techs are coming fast. Any insights about the future and how to adapt today to this future? Yes. Uh, so yeah, well, future is always a good question. And, uh, you know, you're not going to know if I'm right or wrong for a little while. So <laughs> that's yeah. the advantage I have. Um, but, you know, it's, it, I don't, um, I'm not an AI expert. Uh, I've been following mm -hmm. with some interest, uh, you know, what, you know, what's going on with, um, with the language generation tools. And there are certainly some huge um, advantages and, and advancements that are, that are, um, you know, available to us now. Uh, it's interesting, though, at this stage of the game, at least uh, 
where things are right now, you know, I think of AI as being more of a helper than a replacement. You know, it can help us source yeah. information. It can generate some ideas, but without, you know, without the human hand in there with the idea of, um, you know, with, with, with of, of emotion and empathy and, and nuance that humans bring, you know, I, I don't think that the, you know, the AI writing technologies are, are going to replace us anytime soon. I, I don't know, you know, what the far future holds, but for now, it's it's more of a, a tool. The way a typewriter is a tool. Uh, as a matter of fact, Anne Hanley just uh, just wrote a post about that, and um, uh, she's uh, she's from Marketing Profs. And uh, Christopher Graves from Ogilvy wrote a post recently where he was using AI and had asked it to generate some studies on a particular behavioral science principle and the uh, the AI tool fabricated the studies. When he went to look up the studies, they didn't exist. And then he went back to the AI tool and said, <laughs> uh, you know, are these, and it was the, no, no, they're not real. The, you know, the AI tool actually admitted, no, they're not real. And uh, so that was, you know, that was an issue. So I, you know, I think with respect to the, you know, the near future in AI, it, it's more of a helpful tool than it is a, a replacement. Where I do see the future going is um, uh, a greater emphasis on the combination of, of data, data science and behavioral science. Um, I think that, uh, the data science is going to help us find, uh, you know, who to talk to, when we should talk to them, where we can find them, what specific message we should give a particular target. You know, um, I think that, you know, data science or, or artificial intelligence, for that matter, is going to help us in those areas. But then the behavioral science is going to come along and that's going to allow us to serve up the message in the best possible way. So while we might have, you know, uh, artificial help or machine help, you know, kind of through the data so that we can zero in on, on you know, the, uh, the, the person and where to find them and when they're most receptive and what specific message goes to one segment over another, how we serve up that message so that it's noticed, that it's understood, that it's remembered and that it's acted upon, that's where the behavioral science comes into play because, uh, you know, in, in the right hands, uh, a writer, you know, using some behavioral science is going to be more likely to make sure that, that those messages that the writer is putting out there actually connect with the audience and get consumed. So I think as we march into the future, we're going to see a, a, a tighter um, working relationship between data science and behavioral science. Nice, nice. Yeah, I agree. By the way, uh, you know, when I read uh, these books uh, that was written before uh, on internet, before online, uh, I got nothing changed, you know, in human psychology. People are still people, you know. Uh, of course, technologies can help to consume some content faster, to find uh, important information, but psychology you know the same psychology nothing changed now uh, and uh, all your insights that you share on this book on your book you know yeah uh, i can relate to any uh, decade to any uh, i don't know <laughs> any place in history let's see i have the final question uh let's imagine you started from scratch without any experience knowledge skills you didn't write this awesome book you didn't do anything but you need to start from scratch uh what will you do today to learn more about uh human psychology about behaviors any anything about it uh, well well um okay so i didn't if someone's starting from scratch i would suggest they read my book but if the book didn't exist because i didn't write it um yeah um i think you know being a student of the <laughs> they, they, they can read they can read, they can read. Okay. let's imagine yeah. some other wrote this book yeah <laughs> I, I think there's there's a lot you know a lot that would be very helpful in the book but um you know i think you know being a student of the craft you know looking at what other marketers are writing what seems to be out there often because if it's out there often it might very well be because it's working um, reading other authors, uh, you know, I read uh, Robert Cialdini, who I think is fabulous, uh, Roger Dooley, um, Tim Ash, uh, you know, I mean, so there are just so many of them that, uh, that are, you know, really great and, you know, delve into um, how, you know, human behavior and, and, you know, how people make decisions. And so I would, I would start to, to read and then uh, I would look at what, uh, you know, successful marketers are doing. And then I would just start to experiment. I would start to test because that's how you really learn. You know, I've done some of my best work when I've worked for clients, uh, you know, for a year or two or 
three or longer where we've really just been in lockstep together and you know we're putting stuff out in the market and we're seeing what works and we're seeing what doesn't the things that don't work we you know like all right let's try tweaking it this way and see if we can get a win out of it and the things that do work we say all right how can we make it work better and really some of my best work has come out of these long-term relationships where we're just constantly testing and learning and, and iterating um when i started doing some work for for um, the GM credit card, uh, you know, I think one of the first concepts that, that we took to the client, they they turned us around and sent us back to the agency. It was it was that bad, you know. Um, but then as we started to do work that they started to actually buy and put out into the market, uh, we started to do very well. And after you know a, a long term relationship, I eventually left that particular agency. Uh, but I left with seven different control pieces uh, to my name uh, and, and to my team's name too, because I don't want to say that they were all mine. I was working with a team, but but we you know we had identified seven, and that comes from you know just testing things and learning from the test and studying what's working and studying what gets people to respond and, and building on that. So if, if I were starting from scratch, that's what I would do. I would watch successful marketers. I would read some of those authors that I mentioned, the Roger Dooley's, the you know, Robert Cialdini's, uh, Nancy Harhut's, uh, and then I would do a certain amount of, of testing and, and uh, building on what I learned. Yeah, exactly. You know, um, I love that you combine uh, to learn and to test or act, you know, because uh, you can read a hundred books, but if you do nothing, <laughs> you, you you get nothing. Uh, it's like, I don't know, uh, if I read a hundred books, how to play soccer, how I can beat Cristiano Ronaldo or Leo Messi or any, any football player without practice. So practice is more important even than learning. Of course, you need to learn to find ideas, uh, to know how, what to implement. Because for me, it's like you need to find the door that you need to open with acting, testing, adapting, and finding something that actually works for you. Yeah, I love it. Nancy, it's a big pleasure to get in my show, to learn from you. Tell our audience the best way how to reach out to you, how to learn more about you, how to follow you. Well, thank you. Yes, uh, you know, people can find me uh, in a number of places. I'm on social media. I'm on Twitter at N Harhut, LinkedIn, Facebook. You can find me in any of those places. Uh, my agency is HBT Marketing. Our website is HBT MKTG. We shorten marketing. Uh, so you can go to the website. Um, but I, I would love to hear from anybody. And of course, you can find my book. Uh, in places that you know good books are sold clogan page is the publishing house so you can find it at clogan page you can find it on amazon barnes and noble target independent bookstores so uh, i would love to hear from any of your listeners feel free to connect with me reach out and uh and uh, you know if you pick up the book let me know how you like it yeah guys guys by the way this book uh, starts from social proof you know a lot of social proof from roberto caldini uh um, Mark Schaeffer, uh, Andy Christadina, I, I know a lot of these people, they are awesome, you know, they share a lot of valuable insights, so I got the social proof, you know, and after reading all these reviews, I got it, I need to read this book, okay, guys, you can find all these links in the description below, listen us on Apple, Google, Spotify, thanks again for your time, a big pleasure, I love all your insights, when I read this book, I'll share a uh, full review uh, on my LinkedIn account, okay, guys, Thank you for watching and listening us.